I first met uh, Norman Foster, I think, back in 2018 when he visited the lab, and it started a collaboration uh, that, in part, was a, a workshop I did on cities with the foundation in Madrid. And then we, then we launched a project series of meetings around the notion of cities without. And we were looking at mobility without cars, sanitation without sewer, power without carbon, food without soil, learning without schools. When you get started, you, you, you know, we had about 40 of them. That was a lot of fun. Um, then the pandemic hit. And I'm really delighted that we've reestablished a collaboration focused on uh, some of the real challenges that we're facing, and particularly with this, this project to uh, think about the future of, of Kharkiv. Uh, everybody knows Norman. He's the founder of one of the great architectural firms in the world, Foster and Partners. He's president of the Norman Foster Foundation. He's the, I forget what you call the UN patron to cities. Uh, amazing person. So I'd like to welcome Norman Foster. I'd like to say on behalf of the foundation how grateful we are for the support of the Media Lab. Professor Deva Newman, Kent Larson, and your team. Uh, it's been inspirational, and, um, and we're very grateful. Um, it's been said that our greatest invention is the, is the city. And um, every city is effectively designed. And um, I was <clears throat> asked as a urbanist, architect, perhaps over now some six decades, by the Secretary General of the United Nations to address the General Assembly on the importance of master planning and the role that professional design professionals those of us in this room can play in that, in that role. And that led to a request for me to help launch a United Nations declaration in San Marino that was about the principles of sustainable and inclusive planning, urban design, and architecture. So master planning is really at the root of climate change by design. Um, and, and I was asked to give some examples to bring the subject to life because infrastructure, sustainability, they're words that are bandied about. And how, how do they work in practice? How can they transform a community. And perhaps the example that I chose for San Marino has a particular resonance, as we'll see later, because Kharkiv is a victim of its past industrial success. And so that as an issue is common to cities in Ukraine, but it's also common to cities worldwide. And Duisburg in the past, as this image shows, was once upon a time hugely prosperous. It coasted on heavy industry. But with the decline of that industry and neglected industrial buildings and a society kind of caving in, Duisburg is at the convergence of the Rhine and Ruhr valleys. It was originally the industrial heartland. And so that community through its own internal political initiatives and working with the community, held a competition for a master plan, which we won. And this image, one of many models, drawings, um, is around the center of that city, the inner harbor. And through that act of master planning and conscious decisions to re-educate, to retrain, to replace those dying industries with emerging cleaner industries, 
transformed that over, this is working with the community over some three decades, so it's long term. It's not necessarily glamorous, it doesn't produce iconic buildings, but it does transform a community and a society. And here you can see our intervention of buildings for cleaner industries, introduction of bicycle lanes. All this is now back in the, 18, in the 1980s, 1990s. And creating an infrastructure of waterways, of canals, of green parks uh, that would encourage new housing, uh, high quality, affordable uh, rental housing. So if we make that, that jump from the master planning to the urban design, which is a question of scale. Um, and, um, and this, as a space, perhaps has some resonance with Kendall Square in terms of its scale, uh, which Kent and his team will come to later. But this is now going back to the 1990s, and if this is the aerial view of Trafalgar Square at the heart of London, and literally at the heart of the nation, because the distances to remote villages or towns throughout the United Kingdom would be measured uh, from, this, from this space. And um, you can see from this aerial view that it's essentially a roundabout, not just a traffic roundabout, but at the time, before its transformation, uh, was a dangerous pedestrian roundabout, which you navigated at your peril. And at various points, around that space, the pedestrians were literally herded almost like farm animals into steel pens to protect them from the traffic that raged around them. We had a, a proposition which was to transform that from a roundabout by closing the northern road, the road really at the top of this, this space which, as I'll explain later, became a kind of large-scale community-backed decision. But just to leap into ahead of that transformation, this was how that road looked before it was changed. The traffic was removed from that space, and instead of a traffic roundabout, it became a pedestrian uh, route, it became a better setting for the historic buildings which fronted that space. And the Hawksmoor Church at the end, if you were standing there and you look back, then this is how it was before, and now this is how it is now. And of course, over that space of time, everybody's forgotten uh, this, this kind of heritage. If you were in the middle of the space at that time, it would be the territory for pigeons, souvenir stands, and a few solitary individuals who'd brave the traffic to, to cross. That is now opened up. It's a setting for the National Gallery, for the National Portrait Gallery. And, and in a way, it's become a kind of living room for London. So it hosts cultural events, symphony concerts, platform for modern sculpture, circus. Uh, it's a celebratory space, and it's had a completely transformational effect, a ripple effect outwards. But just to give some idea into the process, um, it took place over more than a year. There were 169 observation points, 27,000 drivers were questioned. There were 306 locations, 10,000 people were polled. There were exhibitions with questionnaires, 1,500 questionnaires, and 180 organizations were consulted. So that transformation of vehicular space into pedestrian space took, and it was, in a way, it was democracy in action. It was very reassuring, although it was a marathon. And it's quite interesting to see the effects of a pandemic, because that which took months really would happen very, very quickly after a pandemic. But just to look at some of the quantification of that change, pedestrian movement was multiplied by a factor of 13. 
The walking time across the space was halved. The congestion of the traffic was reduced by some 30%. It coincided with the introduction of congestion charging. And, um, and a consequence of those two initiatives reduced the carbon dioxide in that area by more than 16%. And interestingly, the funds from the congestion charging now contribute something like 122 million pounds a year into raising the quality of public transport. And of course, all that which took so long happened overnight in London. In a matter of weeks, spaces which were occupied by the car, and you see the same thing here in Boston, in New York, in cities around the world. Um, and it's perhaps another instance of the way that after pandemics or crises, cities bounce back resiliently and are stronger later, something perhaps we'll look at in a moment. So if we're talking about master planning, um, United Nations, cities learn from each other. And we can see global trends and we can see how those work locally. One of the things that fascinates me is the way in which over time uh, cities individually have questioned the priorities of vehicular traffic over pedestrian. And so um, here in Madrid, in Europe, we are seeing the way in which a traffic network gives way to a green parkway by relocating or submerging part of the traffic movement. We move from Europe to Asia. We see the same thing in Seoul. Uh, and here, of course, in Boston, in America, North America, we see exactly that. So here we're seeing local instances, but part of a global uh, trend. Some of this, of course, happens organically. In other cases, it's triggered by progressive government initiatives. In 1952, London was smogland for uh, significant parts of the year with mortalities. The Clean Air Act, which was effectively a transfer from dirty coal to cleaner gas, in no time at all, cleaned the quality of air visibly. Um, so historically, crises have shaped our cities and improved them. The Great Fire of London in 1666, we don't think about that fire when we see the DNA of London as it is now. This is how it was before. But fireproof construction was a consequence of building acts, of standards, that were imposed and produced some of the most beautiful architecture and urbanism of brick terraces, of green squares. And similarly, if we stroll along in London, the embankment, we don't think of that as being a consequence of the cholera ec epidemic of the 19th century, which created modern san sanitation, which cleaned up the Thames, which was an open sewer, and of course, Cities learn from each other, so these things would have happened, but the pandemic, the crises, accelerated those trends, just as we could argue that COVID has done exactly that. It's accelerated trends which were already evident. So to end on a master planning note, uh, and there are some differences here in terms of the process, but nonetheless, the consequence the great Chicago fire of the, uh, towards the end of the 19th century resulted in a master plan by Daniel Burnham. And I think his words at that time when he launched that master plan are as powerful today as they were then. As he put it in 1909, make no little plans make big plans, because a noble logical diagram will never die, will live forever. Let your watchword be order and your beacon beauty. Thank you. <laughs>